Hi there everybody, my name is Ollie. I'm a junior doctor living and working in England and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about something even less sexy than the things that I normally talk about, which is portfolio building. I get questions about this from you guys all the time. Now your portfolio is something that I think the majority of medical students quite correctly are somewhat dimly aware of. That is to say that most people have the understanding that portfolio is somewhat important, but probably will become much more important in the future and is not something to be worried about extensively at medical school. And actually, even as someone with, I think, quite an extensive portfolio for my stage of training, I actually agree with this stance. For 90, 95% of people, I think simply surviving medical school and passing all your exams is by far the most important thing for anyone to do. Just crack on, make the most of placement, and be a good and safe doctor for our patients. That has to be the goal. In this video, however, I'm going to try and address two key things. The first is why does portfolio building possibly matter, and who does it matter for? And then secondly, how you actually go about building portfolio. It's often really difficult to know where to start, particularly if you're very early on in your medical career, but we will get to that and hopefully it will relieve some of the anxieties. And the reality is as well that lots of these things are much more complicated than I'm going to be able to cover in this overview, so each area of interest will get a deeper dive at some point. This is just to make you aware of what's out there. And if that's something that you'd particularly like to see or there's an area that you'd like me to focus on in one of these videos so you can see it sooner rather than later, let me know in the comments. So the first thing, why and when is portfolio building important? I think the way to think about it is your portfolio serves as a reflection of you, your skills, your aptitudes, your experiences, and your knowledge. Because just like an artist, a photographer, a designer, an engineer will need a portfolio when they're applying for jobs, the same principles actually apply to doctors, just in slightly different ways. Now, when we apply for our first jobs as junior doctors, a foundation doctor like the job I'm doing now, your portfolio is actually not taken into consideration at all. Everything now, with the recent changes that have happened with the UK FPO, comes from your exam performance, that is both during medical school and the SJT, the Situational Judgment Test, which you sit at the end of medical school. There is no holistic view of you as a person, there is no interview, there is no deep dive, there are no white space questions. You are a number as far as your first job applications are concerned. And in fairness to the system, there's no easy way to do this. You can't interview 6,000 people or look through that many portfolios. You need some sort of quick automated system. So what this means is that for most people, the first time that their portfolio actually becomes relevant is when they're applying for core surgical training or internal medicine training, which happens two to three years after you finish medical school. And ultimately that is why I think it's absolutely okay to just focus on passing medical school because you've actually got loads of time, even once you start working as a doctor, to start ticking your portfolio boxes and doing all of these extra things. There is time. However, I did say we'd cover why you might consider starting to build portfolio as a student, and I think this comes down to three main reasons. First is if you wish to apply for an academic foundation program, or now a specialised foundation program when you start working as a junior doctor, or indeed an academic clinical fellow, an ACF post, later down the line once you get into your specialty training. And these are posts that you take as part of your normal clinical training, and they essentially just give you some protected time to do projects that you're interested in and things that you're passionate about, whether that's research, teaching, leadership, quality improvement. If you have a particular desire to develop your skills in any of these areas, Academic Foundation Programme, Specialised Foundation Programme now, and ACF posts are your opportunity to do that, have some protected time, and these are very competitive and require a portfolio. The second reason that you might consider portfolio building is if you wish to apply for what's called a run-through specialty training programme. There are a small number of specialties within medicine in the UK that recruit straight after foundation year two instead of after core medical or core surgical training. Things like paediatrics, neurosurgery and cardiothoracic surgery for example. These specialties tend to be very competitive to apply for, have a very limited number of training posts for the whole country, and because of this, this necessitates that your portfolio must also be very competitive with a very wide range of skills. 
there is not really going to be enough time to develop a very broad portfolio alongside a busy set of FY1 and FY2 jobs simply because that's not enough time to get projects started through to completion, written up and published as papers, presented at conferences and so on. It takes a long time. And then lastly, the third reason that I'd advise thinking about portfolio is just because you want to. Lots of people are really passionate about lots of different things, often for no other reason than they simply enjoy what they do. Lots of people love doing research, they love teaching other people. All of these things are really important and they should be rewarded, so collect all of these experiences and show how good you are. So now with that introduction out the way, we're actually going to look through some of the different things that might be in a typical medical portfolio. I'll show you some examples of things in each section from my portfolio, just to give you an idea of the sort of things you can do. And the way that I've structured this is using a combination of the portfolio required for internal medical training, what was previously core medical training, and core surgical training, both of which are the first competitive applications most medics will go through that requires a portfolio. So it's a good mix across medicine and surgery of the things that people think are important, basically. However, I do have to advise that every specialty is completely different, often in the types of things that they prioritize or don't prioritize, so be sure to go and check out the specific person specification for your specialty or specialties of interest, because there may be really particular things that they like that we don't cover here. The first thing that most specialties will reward is extra degrees, and this is exactly what it sounds like on the tin. It doesn't really matter whether they're taken before medical school or intercalated into your medical degree and done while you're still a medical student, or done once you've graduated from medical school and are working as a doctor, you can continue to earn additional degrees. In my opinion, extra degrees should never be done just for the purposes of points, because they're a really bad investment in terms of the number of points that you'll get back, but more because they're actually a really good chance to learn something specific about an area that you're interested in and develop your expertise in that area. And typically, the higher the level of your degree, that is a bachelor's, than a master's, than a PhD, and whether you get distinctions or first class honours or whatever, the higher the classification, the more points it will be worth. The next major area is that of academic achievement. Medics are generally a bunch of smart asses, um, as, as we all know, but many specialties will reward being in the top top percentage of brainy people, or at least those who are very good at exams, depending on your view of how education works. The most common way this is demonstrated is by graduating from medical school with honours, that is, say, an MBBS brackets ONS, or what's called graduating with distinction. And usually, in practical terms, it marks out the top 10%, the top decile of your year group at medical school. While obviously this is extremely difficult, because medics are generally very clever, and the degree is very hard, and it's usually only worth a single point, it's a nice thing to have if you can get it. The next area is audit and quality improvement, and I'm going to more generally use the term quality improvement project, because there's lots of different forms that this can take. But most commonly, this is an audit, and what an audit is, is you look at something that's going on in your department that you work in as a doctor or that you're perhaps on placement in as a medical student and comparing the performance of your department to a known clinical standard or a guideline. For example, if you're working on a urology ward, you might look at how long each patient is having their urinary catheters remain in place. If your local guideline says that they shouldn't be in place for any longer than five days, you can look at all of the patients on your ward over a particular time period and see how well your department was meeting that target. Or another example might be on a surgical ward, seeing how many patients are being given the correct dose of tinsaparin, deltaparin, whatever the low molecular weight heparin is of choice, again compared to whatever your local guideline or the NICE guideline is. And what usually happens is you'll inevitably find some sort of failing, then you make some sort of intervention. So you might put posters up everywhere reminding people of the correct way to do things or how long a catheter should remain in place, or a teaching session for all of the junior doctors in the area, and then you re-audit, you collect a load more data over the same period of time again and see whether your change has made any sort of improvement in the quality of service. And this is called closing the loop gathering all your data, comparing your department to whatever the standard is, seeing how well you perform, making a change, collecting a load more data, seeing if your change made any difference, and then bringing the cycle to a close again. 
and most specialties will reward your knowledge of how to do this because it's a really important part of working within a clinical department. The next area, and probably the one that's most familiar to people watching this video, is research and publications. It's carrying out a project of some sort, generating a load of data, analysing it, condensing it all down, turning it into a paper, and then hopefully submitting that paper to an academic journal, at which point it gets published and turned into a journal article. This definitely needs its own video, but it is very possible to do as a medical student. And there are a whole host of things you can do. You might consider doing a survey in your medical school or nationally. You could interview people as part of a focus group. You could do wet lab work, looking at histology specimens under a microscope. You could even get involved with larger interventions that are going on in your hospital, things like clinical trials. There are so many different avenues into research and it is one of the most ubiquitous ways of scoring points at interview. There is no specialty that doesn't like people who can publish research. Now, do note that more papers isn't necessarily better, and I would advise that it's preferable to pump out a small number of quality publications rather than churn out rubbish, and actually being able to demonstrate a range of skills so that you know how to write protocols, secure grants, actually interview people, write for publication, analyse data, having this broad range of skills I would argue is better than simply churning out 50 systematic reviews in niche corners of your specialty, but that's just me. The next thing to talk about is presentations, because once you've carried out your project and hopefully turned it into a paper, the other half to this process is presenting it. This is actually going to an academic conference and telling the world about your work. This is broadly divided into poster presentations and oral presentations, that is, you might be stood next to your poster on a board telling people that come by about it, or in an oral presentation you'll be stood at a podium in front of a lecture theatre, usually or an auditorium, telling the entire crowd about your work, usually with a presentation. And then these conferences can further be divided into national, that is, taking place obviously with delegates from a particular country, such as within the UK, or international, where that conference is going to be attended by people from all over the world. And those international level conferences are usually considered the most prestigious and are as such the more difficult to be invited to. But especially at the student stage, any presentation at a conference is a huge achievement that you should be really proud of. Now the next thing is prizes, and these are one-off achievements that signify excellence in usually one particular domain. The most obvious ones are usually for academic achievement, these are the ones that you'll see most commonly, so it might be for the top exam performance in your year at medical school, for the written exams in a particular year, or for the clinical exams. But there are loads of other ways to get prizes. In fact, here's one I prepared earlier that I just had on hand. So this is an example of a prize that I won at the end of medical school. This is the Pro Dean of Education prize that Warwick awards in final year, which is usually given to a student that has demonstrated excellence in medical education. And it kind of brings me on to the next talking point, which is that there are actually countless prizes awarded every year for loads of different things. There are essay prizes run by every medical organisation under the sun in lots of different specialties and not that many people enter them very often because nobody really likes writing essays. There are poster prizes and presentation prizes at conferences. You might apply for scholarships for elective bursaries from groups like the Royal College of Surgeons and the Royal College of GPs. If you can get academic grants for doing research, they count as prizes as well. There are just so many. And I'll leave some of the links down in the description below to show you where you can access these prizes. The next thing is teaching experience, which I think is a great thing to reward since as doctors we are meant to be responsible for teaching the next generation of juniors that come after us. And this is usually split into two and this is usually split into two broad areas. One is commitment to teaching, or that is actually delivering teaching sessions regularly over a period of time, which might be once a week or once a fortnight for six months, showing that you are dedicated and committed to regular teaching. And then the other half to this is teaching in training, and usually they specify sort of formal accredited teaching courses that have to be done over a minimum number of days. I would say with this domain especially, I wouldn't worry too much about tackling them at medical school because once you're a junior doctor, 
they're actually a lot easier in practice to achieve because your life is a bit more stable and your NHS trust will often reward you for regularly teaching their medical students anyway. Especially if you're planning on taking an FY3 year working as a clinical teaching fellow. This is super easy to achieve and tick both boxes. We then have the idea of leadership and this can be demonstrated in a very vast number of ways. It might be by being the president or a committee member of your specialty society when you're at medical school, the representative of a national medical student society, or working as part of something like the student BMA, basically you have to be in a leadership position where you're making decisions that affect other people and able to demonstrate some kind of positive outcome. And then the last area to think about for applications and portfolio is commitment to specialty. And this is something that you definitely can build while you're a medical student, but it's basically things that are going to convince your specialty interview panel that you're actually interested in the specialty. And almost all of the above areas can be tailored towards this. So that might be attending conferences that are geared towards a particular area of interest, doing courses that are relevant, so perhaps surgical skills, or ATLS courses and getting instructor status where you teach other people, winning prizes related to the specialty, doing things like essay competitions, being part of a specialty society while at medical school. There are so many things that you can spin in this direction. But that brings us to a close guys, I hope I've given you a broad overview of the sorts of things you can do and why portfolio is or isn't important for any given medical student. If you've enjoyed it please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel and if there are any particular aspects that you'd like me to make more focused videos on then let me know and I'll be sure to do that for you. Take care and I'll see you next time.